Welcome. We're so glad to have you here tonight. Um, my name is Rebecca Still, and I'm with Global Campus Connections, and we are very excited to be bringing all sorts of events to you this year, including this virtual tour of Manuscripts, Archives, and Special Collections, specifically the Outrageous Hypothesis exhibit, which Steve is going to be speaking with us about and showing us around. Um, so I just want to really quickly introduce Steve Bingo. He is um, the project archivist at Manuscripts, Archives, and Special Collections at Washington State University Libraries, where he is working on collections related to World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans and a project aimed at developing a network of tribal archivists to assist in the preservation of American Indian cultural heritage materials. A native of Federal Way, Washington, Steve has worked in the archives and libraries in Bellevue, St. Louis, Los Angeles, and Missoula. Steve enjoys cooking Thanksgiving dinner, the poetry of Ann Carson, and movies starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. So we're very glad to have him with us tonight. Um, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We'll be stopping at the end of the presentation to take questions and to, um, just chat about the exhibit. So um, we look forward to seeing your comments. Thanks and enjoy. Go To get a sense of kind of the historical depth of our collection, um, I'm going to let the uh, head of MASS, Trevor Bond, tell you about his favorite item in the collection in this video clip. Uh, one of my favorites is a 13th century papal bull that we have. It's an edict from the Pope protecting a house of lepers so nobody would come in and take their lands or do anything else bad. And it has a seal of the Pope woven into it so you know it's authentic. And at the end of the document, the Pope says, you know, if anybody should violate this ho house, the wrath of God will be upon them. Good stuff. Yeah. This is, you know, from the, uh, from the 1200s and made out of vellum, which is uh, calfskin. Um, so, you know, as you can see, our documents date from the medieval ages up through the 20th century. So getting to the exhibit of um, being wrong. So why did we decide to make this exhibit? Well. Um, our collections, like a lot of other special collections, are full of bad ideas. So we thought, what a wonderful idea to, in a very lighthearted way, highlight our materials to talk about um, a topic that uh, a lot of people in our, in our Wazoo community are going to be talking about. Um, so, uh, and I think what this is an illustration of is um, the fact that, you know, no matter what period of time you look at, um, bad ideas are just kind of a byproduct of getting a better idea of a particular time and place. So uh, the first example that we'll be looking at from our actual exhibit is from the not so distant past uh, in the uh, Depression or 1920s, 1930s, um, about something called the Gravity Plan, which was uh, an alternative to the Grand Coulee Dam that was never put into place, but um, kind of has an interesting story of its own. So we'll go ahead and play that clip and. You know, I really like the Grand Coulee Dam one, and that's because I think it's close to home. And I have relatives that live at Grand Coulee Dam, so it's really interesting for me to see how it might have been or how the plan that didn't work. So that's, that's probably my favorite at this point. So in this section, It Shall Be Done, um, we describe a plan that was never put into action, specifically uh, the gravity plan. So starting in 1918, a really serious push uh, was made to irrigate the Columbia Basin. And as you may know from your Washington State history, the Grand Coulee Dam was built to irrigate an area from about the Tri-Cities on up north to the I-90 corridor. Well, this is the story about the other plan. If we take a look at George Washington here, you'll notice this river that extends from the back of his head on down through uh, to his cheekbone. Now, if you look at Google Maps, that river doesn't exist, okay? What that is, it's a series of canals intended to divert water from the Ponderay River in Idaho down to the Columbia Basin. And these little streams in George Washington's jaw are the, the canals that would actually irrigate the farmland that's now irrigated from the Grand Coulee Dam. Early on, um, this idea uh, was actually the favor plan in the 1920s. And, and it was originally come up with actually in 1903 by a man named E.F. Blaine, and then picked up in 1918 when, Govern, uh, when Governor Ernest Lister decided he would commission a report to examine the feasibility of this plan to hopefully spur economic growth in the region. So following the Lister report, which predictably found in favor of 
uh, the canal system over the Grand Coulee Dam, which itself was proposed in 1918. So in addition to the Lister report, we have a report down here, um, which was written by a man named George Gertels, who was famous for being the lead engineer on the Panama Canal. Um, being a canal guy, he also found in favor of this, of this gravity system. And then we also have a letter from Gertel to Roy Gill, who was one of the um, leading proponents and who really led the charge um, to have the gravity system built. So for the next decade, um, an organization led by Gill called the Columbia Basin Irrigation League uh, pushed to have legislation passed through Congress that would support the building of this canal system. So we have this brochure of a tour given to the members of the Irrigation Reclamation Committee of Congress. And here's a little itinerary where they would go on train rides, view the sites, have nice dinners and breakfasts. Um, that showed both the path for uh, the gravity plan as well as uh, some views of the site of, of a Grand Coulee Dam. But if we look at the uh, documentation of the Columbia Basin Irrigation League, um, they pretty much were um, wholeheartedly behind the gravity plan and only gave this little lip service to, uh, the, to the Grand Coulee Dam. And the supporters of the Grand Coulee Dam decided they weren't happy with the Columbia Basin Irrigation League's efforts, so they formed their own organization called the Columbia River Development League. And they consisted of men shown up here, um, namely Rufus Woods, who was a newspaper editor um, over here. Uh, James O'Sullivan, and Senator Clarence Dill. So as we know, the Grand Coulee Dam ended up being melt, and the gravity plan was thrown on the scrap heap of bad ideas. There's one of the quotes from the book that talks about how our brains do this wonderful magic about making us forget that we were ever wrong. And, you know, that would work except that you have WSU archivists that can dig up the fact that, no, no, you really were wrong. The Columbia Basin Irrigation League, who supported the gravity plan, only accepted the idea of the Grand Coulee Dam after it became pretty clear that the Grand Coulee Dam was going to be the more acceptable plan. And in this cartoon, we see uh, the, the narrative of the uh, gravity plan supporters um, spun in a different direction. So what this shows us is the events leading up to the development of the dam. And what we notice here are a lot of supporters of the gravity plan, like Governor Ernest Lister, who supported the first commission supporting the gravity plan, E.F. Blaine, who came up with the idea, um, George Gertels, who was a Panama Canal engineer who gave support to it, Roy Gill, who largely led the efforts to um, see the gravity plan put into action. And basically that what this narrative um, demonstrates is how the storyline that was popular among supporters of the gravity plan was respun so that it made it look like that they were actually the ones responsible for the dam. Now we have this back and forth um, occurring over the course of the next few years after the Grand Coulee Dam has been approved. And one of the responses by one of the dam supporters is seen in this letter to the Spokesman Review, and it's written by James O'Sullivan. And O'Sullivan specifically comments to an article that refers to E.F. Blaine as the father of the Grand Coulee Dam. And as O'Sullivan writes, as valuable as Mr. Blaine's work has been, Mr. Blaine himself, I am informed, disavows credit for the Grand Coulee project. So even after support for the dam coalesced in the 1930s, the exact story leading up to that was in dispute for, um, for the next few years. Um, so the reason why I decided to start out with that clip is because it gives a good illustration of how these documents tell the stories that make collections like ours so rich. And the thing that um, archivists like to do, and by the way, before I go too far into it, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, more about the documents themselves. But if you want to talk about, ask questions about being wrong, you know, um, passages from the book that relate to, you know, whatever it is I talk about, um, feel free. That's great. I have a copy of the book here. So um, it, it's all good. Um, but what I'm going to uh, talk about here is um, a little bit about um, kind of the story about the documents behind, you know, how they're created and, and used. It's kind of like the difference between if you get a DVD between the, the movie and the director's comments. So what archivists like to do is we kind of look at the, the making of, of these materials. So um, what I'm going to talk about are a couple of things about the Northwest Passage. And there's a section in the exhibit that we won't see tonight. Um, about the Northwest Passage, and Catherine Schultz talks about it uh, in, in her book as well. 
And um, in case uh, you don't know, the Northwest Passage is a uh, mythical water route across North America. And I have a map here from a publication called Gentleman's Magazine from 1754. It's a British publication. And um, maybe a bit hard to tell what's water and what's land, but up here in the upper uh, right-hand corner, you have Hudson's Bay. And you see there's this water path that goes into uh, DuPont Lake and all the way out eventually to the Pacific Ocean right here. So this is one representation of a Northwest Passage that was believed to have been traveled by a guy named Bartholomew, Bartholomew Dufont. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, the reason why the Northwest Passage was so coveted is um, even though, as Schultz says, its existence may be in question, its economic significance was not in question. So to give you an example, I have a letter from one of the early missionaries uh, to Eastern Washington. This is from a man named uh, Henry Spaulding. It's a letter that he wrote in October of 1836 um, when he and the Whitmans made it to uh, basically Walla Walla um, and uh, made their settlement. So it gives a description to um, their, basically the, the headquarters of, um, of where they were coming from, their particular church in, back in New York. Um, about you know what they experienced, what they went through, and one of the things you'll notice if I flip to the back and I'll flip it like this here, and it's really faint, but hopefully I'll point things out to you. So down here it says H. H. Spalding, October 1836. That's when it was sent from Vancouver. Now um, at that point, um, anything going from by water or by ship would go down the west coast of America, down the west coast of South America, then back up the east coast. Um, so this was sent in October of 1836. It arrived in um, Newburyport, Massachusetts in July uh, 26 of the next year. So that's about eight months it took for this letter to make its journey from uh, Walla Walla to Massachusetts. It hasn't even gone to its end point. So if you can imagine, um, how much the how much time could be cut if oops, um, if there was a well-traveled waterway um, that cut straight through the Americas instead of having to go around South America. So the British, um, for about two or three centuries, um, tried very hard to find this Northwest Passage, just for the very reasons I'm talking about, because of um, the economic uh, boon it could create for uh, developing uh, the Western United States. Um, and so I showed you this map from uh, a publication in 1754. It was originally published in 1708. And it's maps like this kind of added fuel to the uh, Northwest Passage uh, frenzy. And this uh, map here is a bit dubious because there's no evidence that Bartholomew de Font um, even took this journey. So its credibility is in question. Um, one of the things that so that's one thing that I think actually makes it pretty cool. But um, one of the other things is the context of this particular map. It's in a gentleman's magazine, which is kind of a hodgepodge of exotic tales and stories about new technologies. I kind of think of it like, um, that, like Discovery Channel, where you have, on one hand, um, shows about um, surviving in, in the wilderness. On the other hand, you'll have a sh next you'll have a show about revamping your hot rod. So next to these maps of exotic places, you have a story like about new developments in air pumps. So you, know, so you have stories about technologies um, next to other um, stories that generally appeal stereotypically to men. So it's kind of like the, the guy channel uh, back in the day. Let's see. So, OK. So judging on the time, um, one of the things I'll talk about just really briefly before moving on, actually, before I do that, are there any questions? So that's one example of you know, a, a, a story, especially a story about being wrong, um, that's uh, illustrated in, in, in our particular special collections. Um, one other thing that I pulled, and one of the nice things about this is this letter is actually online. Um, so this is a letter um, to a man named Ryokichi Sagane, who was a nuclear physicist in Japan during World War II. Um, it was sent by another nuclear physicist from America named uh, Louis Alvarez. Now, 
the story behind this letter is that Sagani and Alvarez worked together at UC Berkeley before the war. And Alvarez went on to work on the first nuclear bombs at Los Alamos. Um, when he learned what was going to happen with these bombs, that two of them were going to be dropped in the United States, he decided that he um, would try to convince his friend, uh, Ryokichi Sagane, to uh, talk to his government to get them to stop the war. So after the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, um, three copies of Alvarez's letter were dropped by plane over Nagasaki in the hopes that they would get to Sagane and he would talk to his government and say, you know, quit this now, otherwise all our cities would be nuked off the face of the earth. Um, and it does kind of have that um, hellfire, end of the world uh, feel to it, even though he tries to be as um, non-aggressive as possible, Alvarez does. Um, so, what hap so the reason why the letter came here is that shortly after the war in uh, 1946, uh, Wazoo President Wilson Compton visited uh, Japan and ran into Zagane, who gave him a copy of this letter to return to Alvarez. Uh, one reason why he may have, might, may have given this to Compton is because Compton's brother was a colleague of Alvarez and also a well-noted nuclear physicist. Um, so you have this story of um, that kind of bridges warring nations, bridges an ocean, and eventually in 1949, um, Alvarez and Sagani come back together. Alvarez signs the letter, and then um, the rest is history. Um, so um, this is another example of how just basically one document tells um, a sh nice little short um, in st uh, story. All right, so uh, this next scene um, uses some older materials to talk about being wrong. And a lot of the, the stuff is from our rare book collections. Um, it's about mythical beasts. So um, without further ado, let's take a look at that. Oh, awesome. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So now this particular letter is online. Um, it's not online through us. It's basically, um, it happens to be on a blog. Um, so what I've done is at the end there'll be a PowerPoint and everything that I know that's online from this presentation is going to have a link to it or a URL on the concluding PowerPoint. So in, in the case of the Nagasaki letter, yes. Um, in the case of the false map of the Northwest Passage, no, but there is actually a pretty awesome site about um, the history, illustrating the history of the Northwest Passage through maps. Um, I think that's run through Princeton. But in any case, if you have any questions, um, you could feel free to, to email us that mask. So. There's a lot of stuff that I find really fun. Um, the weird animals um, always kind of catch your eye. In this section called Bewildering Beasts, we see animals, people, and microorganisms hatch from the imagination. So we'll begin in the 1600s and 1700s as European explorers are encountering animals that they've never seen before, and they're having to describe these animals to printers that are very eager to publish their findings. And what we'll see are imaginative renderings of re real world animals. So to begin with, we'll look at this rendering down here. So most of you will probably recognize this as a llama, or as they call it, a wool camel. Now it's a pretty good representation of the actual thing until we look at these front feet. You notice those big gnarly claws that, as one of my colleague points out, uh, calls to mind one of the beasts from where the wild things are. More imaginative end of the spectrum, we get this creature here. Now this, in, in the book from where this picture comes, um, this animal is described as being as large as a large dog um, with the head and mouth of a hog uh, 12 teeth on each side of its mouth, two of which are 12 inches long. Now, other than the, now it, it does look a little larger than a large dog, and we do have this kind of caveman woolly mammoth scene back there. Um, but what this likely describes is a babarusa, which looks more like a pig than a deer, as, as portrayed here. So now, as European explorers were exploring beyond the ocean, European scientists were exploring the world underneath the microscope. And what we see with these depictions of the microscopic world is how we, re how we rely on what we know to describe what we don't know. So for example, this picture here is supposed to be the face of a tapeworm. It has the eerie appearance of a scarecrow's face with two eyes, a mouth, and even a nose. Now, if you've ever seen a tapeworm face before, you know that it has neither eyes nor a nose, and what we call a mouth are actually a couple of rings of big suckers. 
And in this uh, image down here, which is taken from a book roughly translated as you know, things that are born in the body of man, we have this little parasite that has the head of a horse, um, a human foot, a talon, and that looks more like a mythological farm animal than anything that grows inside the human body. So what these strange beasties show us is the way that the imagination fills in where no, no knowledge exists, and the way that that imagination can invite an element of fiction into describing things that are particularly exotic and unknown. I think my favorite thing in the exhibit is the copy of the Nuremberg Chronicle, which is more than 500 years old and shows fantastic creatures that um, are non-human. And just, it's a real delight to see. So when talking about mythical people, we have some examples of monstrosities from what's known as the Nuremberg Chronicle. Now this was printed in about 1500. The first edition was printed a little before in 1493. Now the Nuremberg Chronicle was the Wikipedia of its day in that it attempted to bring together a wide body of facts into one place. And moreover, it leveraged a new technology to make this information accessible to anybody with the resources and technology uh, to come into it. So what we see here in terms of the people represented um, are from an account by Pliny the Elder, who was a, a first century naturalist in the Roman Empire. Now one of the things that Pliny describes are uh, we have a fellow with big ears down here. Um, this person is, called, is from a people called the Panadi, and they were believed to have lived in Scythia, which is in modern-day Ukraine. And one of the things that Pliny describes is that they would uh, use these ears to cover themselves up like blankets if the weather got too cold. And here you have uh, all, so all sorts of um, strange and exotic people. You know, this fellow with the big foot. Uh, this guy with no head over here is believed to have lived in Nubia, northern Africa. And one of the things that you see here is that um, while you know, scholars scour the libraries of Europe to bring together facts, we see that uh, the misunderstandings from previous generations are being passed down through the Nuremberg Chronicle. And like many other information technologies, print is wonderful for the spreading of information. It's also uh, wonderful for the spreading of misinformation. And what we see here is that imagination is crucial for understanding the world around us because it allows us to negotiate the unknown. However, it also opens up a world of speculation and an element of fiction to enter into our, uh, to enter our, into our models of the world. So the section about bewildering beasts, um, part of the story is about how um, a new communication form, the printed book, is used to talk about some new and exciting findings from um, either what was to Europeans the new world or some uh, new scientific discoveries. So uh, in talking about um, the way that communication has changed uh, over uh, Western history, I'm going to begin with this item here, which is from the 1500s. So it, it is from the period where uh, print existed in, in Europe. And what this is, this is Spanish, and this is um, called a missile. So this is mostly music for masses um, given at a Catholic church for various celebrations. And the dates for these masses range from July to September. And you can see it's a, they're starting to use kind of like the five line bar that we're familiar with, but the notations are obviously different. The writing is in Latin. Um, and this, the thing uh, about this is that unlike a lot of the other books, this is actually handwritten. And I believe this is vellum. Um, and um, cowhide. And this would have been somewhat contemporary uh, to the Nuremberg Chronicle, which we talked about um, in, the, uh, in the presentation about the bewildering beasts. Now, if we think about um, this particular book and how it was actually used by right, sheet music, so it was meant to be performed. In other words, it's, uh, it's a remnant of our um, oral tradition um, in, in Western culture. Um, and if you think about the 1500s, while there was kind of a small class of literate people, um, the vast majority of people were illiterate uh, in Europe at that time. So if you think about um, a book like the Nuremberg Chronicle, which even though it has these awesome pictures and family trees um, and funny people, um, the actual audience for this was quite small. And uh, just to give you a sense, the first edition of the Nuremberg Chronicle, about uh, 1,500 were produced in Latin, and about 750 were produced in German. This one is actually in German. 
Now by the 1600s and 1700s, print becomes more widespread, which is uh, predictable. Um, so, and you get a varying range of documents in terms of quality. So this is a pamphlet called Ladies Miscellany, and I love the subtitle of this. It's a, a curious collection of amorous poems and merry tales. It's a little titillating, right? Um, kind of like a, a harlequin, perhaps. And as you can see, it's, it's small. There's, I'll flip through it, not a whole lot in the way of illustration, uh, mainly poems. And something that's a little more substantial is this copy of Paradise Lost from um, 1688, it's, it's the fourth edition. And the pages have stood up a little better. The binding is very nice. And then also in this book, there's some pretty awesome illustrations here at the beginning of each, uh, beginning of each book. Paradise Lost, I think, has 10 books to it. So they have a lot more craftsmanship to something like this than uh, the miscellany. And if you think about how print was changing um, the way both entertainment and information during the time, um, you consider a book like this, which it's not too exciting to look at, but it's a pretty famous novel called Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Um, the first edition of this was, this, this edition was written in six volumes. The first edition was written in 10 volumes over the course of 1949. Came out periodically as a serial novel. It's kind of like a an early version of a television show, right? So you had to wait before the next uh, edition came out and you got to learn a little bit more about the story. So I think one of the things that comes through here, especially with the illustrations, you see that we have this interesting mix of entertainment and information um, that combine in, in, in the early print culture. So. It is, yeah. I, I was going to ask about questions. So, um, the thing that we tend to use gloves for, at least here and in most places that I've worked, um, is for photographs. Um, and it's basically the, the nature of the material itself. So a photograph, the bottom of it's paper, but the top is um, what we call an emulsion, which contains all the pigments and things like that. So that's really sensitive to finger oils. But paper, there is some sensitivity there. But the concern with cotton gloves and paper is that it catches, so it's really easy to rip brittle paper with cotton gloves. So it's actually probably better just to use your bare hands than, than cotton gloves with, with plain old paper. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> Straight dirt. Um, uh, were there any more questions before I talk a little bit more about uh, photographs? Oh, this one here? Yeah, it's got this awesome hardware and these you know, brass knobs, yeah. And I was going to bring out some, we, we actually have some uh, medieval scores as well from like the 1300s and 1400s, but those are actually on loan, unfortunately, so I couldn't display those for you. And I don't read Latin, so you know, I don't know if you sing these songs, if you know, like a giant will or an ogre will peer out of nowhere, but it's fun to think about. <laughs> Okie doke. And so um, as we begin to move forward in time, there were, there were no more questions, right? No. OK, awesome. Um, you, there, we begin to develop new ways for documenting ourselves and uh, methods that are uh, much more immediate um, in, in the way that they capture life. So for example, photographs and sound recordings. So what I have here are. Um, some examples of photographs in our collections. And um, so the, the photograph started to really develop um, over the course of the 1800s. And you know, as the technology became more widely available, it became used for um, various purposes. So one purpose is to document uh, one's own life. So I have those two photos in the background there. Of um, So this is a story from um, Earlier, I mentioned uh, the Japanese American incarceration. So th this was from one of those camps in America during World War II called Heart Mountain. And you can see um, the guy with the camera there, Frank Hirahara, who was imprisoned in, in Heart Mountain. And so he um, used the camera to document his life in this very unusual circumstance. And um, you know, his documentation gives you a sense of kind of like the landscape and in a lot of ways, the daily life at Hartmount. And we have that other more dramatic photo of Hartmount in the background and 
um, the man facing off towards it. Um, in addition to documenting one's own life, um, we see, I'm going to switch sides here, hopefully this doesn't, one thing, uh, people documenting for publicity. So this is from a collection called the Pangborn Collection. Now, Clyde Pangborn was a barnstormer, which means he was basically did stunts on airplanes, which were pretty cool. So if we look at this poster, here we'll see death-defying stunts. And you see the wing walker and um, Pangborn. I don't know if that's Pangborn on the wing. or No, that's Diavolo on the wing. But so Pangborn did this um, mainly in the 1920s. And he was actually a flyer during World War I, which is where he learned the craft. And just to kind of relate this to being wrong, we have a series of photos from a stunt that he attempted at Coronado Beach, um, where he, that's him on the car. And, he, and they're trying to move this person from the car into the airplane. So you, you see here the airplanes come in, dude's on the car, grabs onto the ladder. And oops, he fell off the ladder. So this was obviously uh, um, a stunt that went wrong. Um, and that, that was one of the few stunts, actually, of his that, that did go wrong. So um, you know, and, and I think if you know, this is a good example of being wrong. And um, I think it probably holds also to Catherine Schultz's theme that um, you know, life is full of risk, right? And you, part of um, being alive is taking those risks, and on occasion. Um, suffering uh, a miscalculation. Now, the nice story about Pangborn is that uh, in the 1930s, um, he ultimately does go on to be the first person to cross the Pacific Ocean uh, without stopping. So he does, he, after his barnstorming days, he does achieve a certain amount of fame that, uh, that hopefully lives on to, to this day. So in addition to documenting life and um, and publicity, uh, photographs were also used to document the lives of others for uh, anthropological purposes. And largely, that's photography was a boon to anthropologists studying um, different cultures. So this is from a collection called the Edward Curtis Collection. And it's called the North American Indian. It was published in, this is, I believe this says from 1907. There's, I can't remember how many volumes. It's, it's, over a dozen. So there's a lot of volumes of these. It's a massive collection. Um, and the idea with this is that uh, Curtis believed that Native Americans, they were a, a dying race. So if we don't um, document the people and their culture now, um, we would lose all trace of it, all memory of it. So he went on this mission to uh, photograph tribes across the United States to um, try to preserve, um, again, what he saw as a dying way of life. So I have a volume here that's from this particular area of um, Nez Perce and Cayuses. And I've taken a couple of photographs here. This is of a Nez Perce chief named Yellow Bull who was um, involved in the, um, in the Battle of Bill, Big Hole and the march um, of the Nez Perce from, um, their, uh, from their land in the Northwest in an attempt to flee to, to Canada. And then we have a nice photo here um, of, uh, from a tribe called the Wisham along the Columbia River as they're fishing for salmon. And um, if you think about um, the longevity of, of different documents, um, you know, the, the pamphlet that's obviously you know, made for mass distribution, not necessarily to be um, to stand the test of time. Um, this, you know, these volumes you know, cost a lot of money, and the idea was hopefully that they would um, stand in for, you know, for these dying people, you know, in, in perpetuity. So this one, so this documentation is meant to be a little more permanent, even though unfortunately the paper's acidic, so it's uh, that choice wasn't so good. But there were, um, I can't remember the exact number, but. I think that there was a goal of 5,000 to be sold. He didn't quite fill that goal, but the, the, the number of these published was in, the, was in like the low thousands, whereas at the time other books would have been you know, published in much greater quantity. And I guess one last thing that I'll, 
all this straight in. If you think about the way, whoops, wrong gloves, that Curtis documented Indians as he took photographs with a camera that used glass negatives. So, sorry for leaving the camera here. This is really heavy. And these aren't Curtis's photos, but this is an example of a glass negative from our Washington State University collection. So when Curtis would have been taking photographs, he would have been lugging around a big camera with a tripod. He's not doing a point and shoot thing with his iPhone. It would have been awesome if he had an iPhone at the time. Um, but then he would have been loading you know, these plate these glass plates into his camera, which captured, you know, if you could see it from there, which captures the image, kind of like film does, uh, well, did for us today. I don't know that many people use film nowadays. It's a weird world. Um, in any case. Glass right, yeah, exactly. The film was a new glass negative. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you could think about the, the documentation back in Curtis's time, it was a lot more cumbersome. Um, so that the challenges were, were certainly greater. Okay, so the reason why I talk about these developing technologies, and I guess to give you a sense of our technologies over the ages, is because the next section is going to highlight the use of two technologies to prove um, a hypothesis, photography and flight. And just to give you a sense of how fast we've gone through technologies in the 19th in the 20th century. This is just from one collection. We have some film. We have some, this is audio tape, reel to reel. So if you open it up, see, before we had cassette tapes, we stored audio and things like this. So that's basically cassette tape tape, but on a bigger, bigger spool. Probably should be handling that differently. Okay. And then, of course, our handy dandy VHS tapes. Awesome. And we're starting to get some computer disks as well. Woohoo! Okay. So, in this next section, we'll be talking about the development of the Columbia Basin and how, partly about how photography was used to prove um, a thesis by a guy named Harlan Bretz. You know, this is such a cool thing because it's such a good example of what we used to think was right and now we're completely wrong about it. So in this section, cataclysmic mega floods, um, this is about the role of certainty in our ability or inability to spot error. And it begins with another Schultz, or, and it begins with another quote by Catherine Schultz, and that is, um, one of the most defining and dangerous characteristics of certainty is that it is toxic to a shift in perspective. Now to give you a little backstory, um, in the early 20s, uh, a geologist named J. Harlan Bretz had this idea that the Challenge Gab Lance, which defined much of the Columbia Basin, were caused by this huge flood. Now, he had a lot of evidence for this, the um, big rectangular canyons that we call coulees, the ripple look to much of the landscape. But unfortunately, this idea went contrary to one of the central concepts of geology at the time, which was that the Earth was formed uh, by slow, gradual processes. And that's largely known as the uniformitarian principle. And um, so in order to prove this hypothesis, um, J. Harlan Bretz uh, needed a few things. One, he needed a source of water um, that would account for such a flood. And he was given help by a man named J.T. Pardee, another geologist in the 20s, who came up with the idea of this large glacial lake in western Montana and northern Idaho called Glacial Lake Missoula. So once he had the water and the idea, um, he needed to uh, convince other geologists that this idea was in fact sound. So one thing he did here is, we see in this photograph up here, he led an expedition in 1928 of some uh, Princeton scholars and journalists into the Columbia Basin to show them what he was talking about in, in terms of his evidence for this um, cataclysmic mega flood. And this journey is documented down here in a copy of Intermountain Motorist, which is published by the AAA. And the title is given this wonderful name that's very evocative of the jazz era, Red Hawk Coolies. 
And in addition to um, leading this tour, um, what he thought would really sell his idea was aerial photography. So now this was back in the late 20s, early 30s, where aviation was still kind of in its early days. So this was um, one of the early uses of aerial photography for um, describing the Earth's uh, geo or geology. So in order to um, have these aerial photographs taken, he needed some financial backing. So what we have here is a letter to a, a Spokane banker named W.D. Vincent and in an attempt to get funds for his aerial photographs. Now, we don't know whether or not Vincent gave him the funds, um, but we do know that he did get them eventually and produced the aerial photographs um, that we'll see shortly. That's the stuff that really appealed to me is just the fact that there is some, not validity necessarily, since it was obviously wrong and it's been proved wrong, but well-meaningness and science behind it, even if it ended up wrong. It's not just crackpots. So Bretz finally did manage to get the money for the aerial photography, and this is a 1932 volume produced with those aerial photographs called the Grand Coulee. Now, what you'll notice in addition to his arguments and the various photographs in the collection, there's one of the aerials, um, is that he pr provided some of these stereoscopic views, which provided a three-dimensional perspective at the time. And what, what these would uh, record is the depths of the great coolies that Bretz was trying to describe. So the way this worked was you would slide it into this handy dandy thing, look through here, and then slide it until you get this three-dimensional effect that um, reminds me of some of those magic eye uh, paintings that were popular back in the, in the mid-90s. You would get this holographic effect. So debate over the formation of the scav lands persisted for decades after this, um, until the 1970s. And in 1979, Bretz was given the Penrose Medal, uh, which is the highest honor from the Geological Society of America. And what uh, Bretz's challenge to science demonstrate was the difficult and at times long process of changing entrenched beliefs. So while the certainty that developed around uniformitarian beliefs likely helped the advancement of theories useful for understanding certain landscapes. In the case of the Channel Scab lands, this certainty blinded the imagination to the possibilities offered by Bretz's novel observations. Um, so what I hope that this exhibit emphasizes, uh, on one hand, um, the richness of special collections like Mass and, and others across the world. And in terms of the book, um, one of the things that I think that this emphasizes too is that no matter uh, what time period you look at, you'll find, you know, tons of examples of being wrong, this uh, particular time period not accepted. Um, so on a concluding note, um, since we're all part of the Wazoo community, um, I thought I'd talk about this concept of Kugan, and we actually have a, um, a little display about uh, the origin of the term Kugan. So um, now, the, the exact origin of it is perhaps somewhat in question, but um, we could trace one source to 1985. Now, these are some football programs from that year. This is their press guide. And this is from a game against Arizona State University. Now, after this game, there's a Spokane sports writer who claims to have uh, coined the term. Now, let me just give you a little context here. So in 1985, Washington State University had a pretty loaded team. Um, they had a running back named Ruben Mays, who the prior season set the single game rushing record. Uh, for Washington, but just for the NCAA um, in 1984. They had Mark Rippon, who would go on to be a Super Bowl MVP. And um, so they, they had a lot of talent and a lot of returning freshmen. In 1984, they finished six and five. Being a year better, they thought they'd do, they'd do better than them, maybe even to compete for the Rose Bowl. Well, by midseason, they were two and five. Big disappointment. And they were facing Arizona State. Um, in that game, um, they lost a close contest, 16 to 21, and there was a very famous, well, not famous play, there was a play that they, um, that, that was referenced in this article by John Blanchett um, that they really choked or cooked it. And in this article, um, Blanchett didn't come up with the term cooking it, he just came up with the verb to cook from which our, you know, from which our beloved term cooking it comes from. Um, so now one way to think about cooing it, um, if you think, and even if you think about this particular season as well, um, it's one of the consequences of 
um, taking on a large challenge and having high expectations. And then, so something that sometimes happens is you don't meet that expectation. Um, so cooking it is a way to, um, to deal with these setbacks with kind of a grudging, grudging sense of humor. So um, in conclusion, you know, Catherine Schultz kind of notes that um, this is a very liberal paraphrase, um, but that uh, you know, a life well lived um, kind of involves straying from kind of those hard and solid truths that give us comfort, right? Um, there's this quote in her book, um, two heirs to wander and by wandering uh, we learn about ourselves. Well, you could substitute Coog in there, I think. You know, by Coog, we um, explore the world around us and eventually um, come, come to know ourselves as well. Uh, so with that, um, I hope that gives you a, a, a solid note to end with relating the book to your own identity as a Cougar. And I'll give a couple of slides here that give uh, URLs to um, some of the materials that I talked about and ways to explore special collections uh, from your location. So um, PowerPoint, all right, slides up. So um, like I said, this is a list of some of the materials that are referenced, the atomic bomb letter. Um, a lot of these are from our collections here at Washington State University. And one thing that I didn't get to was the propaganda posters, but we have a wonderful display of propaganda posters at Washington State University that's worth checking out. And we also have our own YouTube channel of archival videos Check out, um, uh, what is it, All, All Hail Washington State University. It's, it's, like, it's a promotional film, and the theme song is like a beer commercial. It's pretty awesome. So this next slide is um, some ideas for how you might, if you're interested in looking at some special collections, whether it be old books or manuscript materials, how you go about doing that from your location, wherever you are. So in terms of books, um, as a Washington State University student, you have access to something called Early English Books Online through um, the WASU Libraries page. Um, and um, it has old, obviously, English books from um, like the 1600s and 1700s that are digitized. Um, also, there's some mass digitization projects like uh, the Hathi Trust and uh, Google Books, and those are easily Googleable. Um, in terms of looking at um, what I would call manuscript materials, like uh, photographs and letters and diaries. There's this great website called Archive Grid, where it's basically um, it's a map of the United States, and it asks you to select a state. If you click on a state, it'll give you a list of um, archives in the area. So you click on that, and it'll show you where it appears on the map, so you can see what archives are in your area. And of course, you know you could always contact us as well. One tip, um, make sure to contact the special collection ahead of time because their hours tend to be limited and um, their collections tend to be fairly specific. So you want to make sure they actually have something you're interested in. And it could, your question could be anything from, I'm interested in old maps or maybe more subject specific. Um, I would like to see some letters from the Civil War, you know, what have you. So that concludes my presentation and thank you for your questions and um, thank you for viewing. It's been a pleasure.